Alright guys, today we're going to be discussing pages 251 through 271, and this is where we've really kind of moved into the final act of the book. This section of the book is called The Corner, which of course is the place where executions are carried out in uh, Kansas. And the reason I call this the final act of the book, you know, we've had a lot of things leading up to this. We learned about the past of Dick and Perry and the past of the clutters. Then we learned about the murder. Then we have this portion of the book where Dick and Perry are kind of on the run, and we see the investigators closing in on them. Well, now that they've been caught, we're moving on to the part of the book that really covers their trial and their incarceration. And so at the beginning of this section, we see Dick and Perry being extradited to Kansas, where they're going to be staying in town in Garden City until their trial is over. And... Um, there is not a lot of jail room in Garden City. It's this tiny little area. And so um, Dick is put in with like the rest of the regular prisoners who are normally, like they said, you know, people who have been arrested for public intoxication or people who have been arrested for domestic violence. Very normal, kind of small town sort of crimes. Not any like other murderers or anything like that. But they want to keep Dick and Perry separated so that they can't, you know, work together on their defense. And so Perry is put in a cell that is normally for women. And it's actually inside the housing quarters or the living quarters of the under warden, kind of like the assistant warden and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Meyer. And Mrs. Meyer kind of takes, I don't know if I would say a liking, I would say pity. She takes pity on Perry and she takes care of him. She fixes his favorite meals. She's very sympathetic to him. Um, and, you know, I think Perry really has it a little bit better in jail because he does have human contact. He does have people to relate to. At this time, he also kind of adopts a pet squirrel. There's this little squirrel that comes to his window every day and he feeds him and talks to him, gives him a name, Mr. Red, and they're, you know, best buddies. And um, again, you know, this is a detail that Truman Capote includes that makes Perry a lot more sympathetic. Some guy who becomes best friends with a squirrel, it's like something from a Disney movie. And it really makes us realize that kind of softer, more vulnerable side of Perry. Um, and it's a very sweet part of the story, but it contrasts very strongly against the fact that he is, you know, an accused murderer who's about to be on trial for that murder. Um, so this is the point where Perry makes a change in his statement and he amends his statement to say that he was the one who killed everyone. Now the thing that's really interesting, and here's a little bit of, you know, hopefully not something that's going to be a spoiler for you because you should be to this point in the book, but they never let Dick know about this. He is sitting there in jail this whole time before the trial thinking that he stands accused of the murders of the two clutter women, but he's not. Perry amends his statement and they go into the murder trial with these statements from two men who now say, no, Dick didn't try to kill anyone. But they're kind of sticking with this original statement of Perry's. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, Dick later, we'll talk more about this, but he finds out at trial that he actually, you know, he never confessed to a crime. Perry had accused him of a crime, but then takes it back. And it's a very interesting twist in the trial, which Dick really uses later to kind of build this case that it was really unfair what happened to him at trial because there's no, I mean, there's evidence that he was there and he's admitted that he was there, but there is no concrete evidence that he was involved in the murder, in the killing side of what happened that night. Um, and so again, some more details of the story come out. We learn about how Dick and Perry um, disposed of some of their bloody clothes, disposed of some of the evidence of the murder. Of course, Dick, though, he has this gun that he loves. He takes it home. It's just sitting in his parents' living room, his parents never knowing up until the point that it comes to get taken away that it is, in fact, a murder weapon. Um, and I think, you know, that shows the foolishness of Dick, which we've seen over and over again. The fact that they came back to Kansas City or to the United States at all is foolish. And it doesn't make sense for someone who doesn't want to get caught. Why Dick would want to get caught, I don't know. But he definitely seems like someone who that doesn't, at least he's not thinking about it as much as maybe I would be if I had committed a murder and was worrying about getting caught. Um... There are attorneys who have been appointed to Dick and Perry. You know, that's how our legal system works, that if you can't afford a defense, then one is provided for you free of cost. It's part of having a fair legal system. But the people who are defending Dick and Perry don't want to. They are attorneys with a good reputation in the town. They're not attorneys who do murder cases. Um, you know, they do like wills and um, estates and like some kind of more placid 
vocab word, kind of quiet law work. Um, and really, they're probably not very qualified to defend Dick and Perry. Although I will say, from what we can see in Capote's recounting of the trial, I think they did the best job that they could have, given the evidence and the lack of participation by Dick and Perry in their own defense at certain points in time. But they make it very clear that they don't want to help with the trial. They don't want to be involved with the trial. But the judge appoints them, and so they, they do attempt to do their job. But it must be very hard to be defended by someone who you know who has said out loud and for the record that they don't want to be involved in trying to help you. And it's got to be a difficult position to be in. And I don't think that I'd feel very confident in the defense that was provided by that person who doesn't care about, you know, my innocence, my guilt, my life, my death. That would make me very uncomfortable as a defendant. Um, and so Dick and Perry end up uh, taking a lie detector test. And this is something that I had talked a little bit about in a previous video. But when Dick and Perry were in Florida, there was this murder of a family in Tallahassee, almost exactly like the Clutters, same family composition, four people, two parents, two kids, very similar um, method of killing with a shotgun. And this is a case, and I think I told you guys this in the previous video, that has actually been reopened in 2012. They exhumed Dick and Perry's bodies to look for DNA evidence connected with this Florida crime. And they actually end up taking a lie detector test in the time covered in the book, to prove whether or not they were involved in that murder because it was so similar to the murder that they had committed and because they were there at the time that it happened. Now, you know, as this is continually unfolding, it seems amazing to me that the year that we're reading this book so many years later that this case is still unfolding, we'll see what's going to happen with whether or not they find that they were involved with that. But at the time, there wasn't enough evidence to suggest that they were involved and they don't end up getting charged for that or really even investigated more than just a little bit. But that crime remained unsolved. They never figured out who did that other crime. Maybe because it was Dick and Perry, you know. It, it'll be interesting to see if we ever find definitive evidence of were they killers of twice as many people as they said they were and would there be evidence at this other site to show that Dick was a killer? that he was someone who had done what he tried to blame Perry for. Um, and so that that kind of comes and goes, and they're, they're waiting, and they're waiting to go on trial. And Perry receives a letter from this man that he had been in the Army with. And the guy has seen him in the news and has seen what he's accused of. And he says, you know, I always thought you were a really nice guy. I always enjoyed serving with you. And it's not someone that Perry really remembers. Um, he sees a picture and kind of thinks he remembers him, but it's not someone that he was like best friends with, but this guy is a Christian and I find it very interesting that there are many Christians throughout the book, including Mrs. Meyer, the under warden's wife, who he's staying with, Willie J, who have tried to convert Perry, who sees something salvageable in him, something important in him to be saved. And this former army friend of his is writing to him to try to get him to be saved by God. But the letter is very important to Perry because the former army friend signs it, your friend. And Perry is someone who at this point feels very isolated. He knows that Dick has turned on him. He's about to be on trial for murder. He has no family. You know, Dick has family. They care about him. They've been involved in the trial and trying to help him. Perry's really isolated. I mean, he's befriended a squirrel for heaven's sakes. So this is a really important relationship to him. And he starts corresponding with this guy and sending letters back and forth. And they actually really do start a friendship and rekindle a friendship because of the trial and because of, you know, Perry kind of, I don't want to say being famous, but being well known because of the trial. Um, so at this time that, you know, Perry's making best friends with the under warden's wife and getting a pet squirrel and a pen pal, Dick is in his cell making a shiv. And again, you know, we see Perry is this beautiful, wonderful person who does all these great things. Dick's about to kill someone. And he has this whole elaborate plan of how he's going to escape and he's not going to help Perry. He's going to leave Perry behind and he's going to go and start a new life for himself. Well, of course... I mean, we know they get executed. It's not, no spoiler alerts here. Um, he gets found out. They take away his shiv. And, um, you know, that really kind of is the end of, at this point, Dick trying to escape because he knows that that opportunity is going to be taken away from him. Perry, too, has been thinking about escape, but of a more personal nature. Perry has, throughout his life, we, we find out at this point in the book, had a lot of thoughts of suicide. And I think we can understand from Perry's past being very unloved and rootless and familyless, having two siblings who 
pretty much killed themselves. I mean, his sister was kind of an accident. Um, we can see how he may have had suicidal thoughts before. And he has this whole thing of how he's going to like break the light bulb in his in his cell and, and kill himself. And it's it's a really it's it's pretty sad. I mean, he's a murderer, and I know we need to remember that. But I've gotten sucked in. You know, I, Capote wants us to be, and I it makes me sad to think about Perry killing himself, even though he is a bad person and he's in a very bad situation. Um, Perry has started to be really observational about a lot of the things that are happening in the town. There are these cats that he sees come through town every night to, um, this is kind of gross, but this is what they're doing, to go and look at the grills on the cars, on the front of the cars, to see if there's any, like, guts from dead birds or bugs that they can eat. And Perry feels like he is like them. He feels like the world has never given him anything. He's very lonely. He's very alone. And he's just scraping by in the universe, getting whatever he can. And, um, you know, when Capote first brought up the cats, it's like another one of those things where it's like, okay, Capote, tell us about another wheat field. Or, oh, okay, here's a random cat. Sure, let's talk about that. But when he brings in this metaphor, again, you know, in terms of Capote being kind of a poetic writer, it's a really sad metaphor. These are these unloved street cats that no one cares about, that probably only Perry even notices them. And he feels like he is like them. Perry also has this situation where there's some guys who stand outside his cell and he thinks about, um, you know, escaping. And he writes them a note to say, you know, if you want to help me, you know, let's do this. Um, but then they never show up again after he writes the letter and he starts to wonder if he might have imagined them. And I think it shows us this kind of like, I want to say darker side, he's a killer, so we can't really see much, too much of a darker side of Perry, but a more disturbed side of Perry, a side of Perry that is less in touch with reality than maybe what we've seen from him before. Um, so we end up seeing that they do not change the location of the trial from Garden City because there is not enough of a good reason, according to Perry's lawyer, to do that. And I have to say that I think that it would have been a much stronger case for them to go somewhere else. This community really is kind of against them. But Perry's lawyer says, you know, this case is so well known, it's so far known, that they're not going to find a better, fairer trial somewhere else. I, I don't know that I would agree with that. I think that this trial really hit home for the people there. And it certainly would have been hard for them to get a fair trial there. Um, we also see here that um, Dick's lawyer, who I think is a little bit better lawyer if I'm kind of comparing the two, wants for Dick and Perry to have a psychiatric evaluation because they want to be able to use an insanity defense. Now, from this point in the book forward, Capote gets kind of technical about some of the legal and psychiatric um terms and different edicts and things that he discusses. But he does repeatedly refer to this thing called the McNaughton Rule. And then what the McNaughton Rule says is that someone can be convicted of a crime even if they are mentally ill because the main thing that's important is did they know what they were doing was right or wrong? If you don't know what you were doing was right or wrong and you're just so crazy out of your mind that you had no concept, then under the monoton rule, then you you could be found, you know, innocent by or not guilty by reason of mental defect. But that's not Dick and Perry. They know what they did was wrong. They just don't really care. And there's a lot of debate in this country to this day of is the monoton rule really what we should be going by? Or um, there's another rule which Capote talks about later, which says that um, if you have any kind of mental disease or defect, that you can't be convicted of a crime. Um, and that's kind of a broad rule. We've never in our country really found the good middle ground between what legally insane and legally sane really means. Um, but their lawyers are hoping that if they can get them declared legally insane, that they won't have to be executed. At this point, no one's trying to really like get them out of jail or save them from jail. They just want to save them from death. That's really the biggest goal in the trial at this point. Um, but they won't let them go to this nice fancy hospital nearby to get these evaluations done. And so they end up getting examined by like some local doctors who don't even practice psychiatry. And they're like, yep, they're fine. Now later this changes a little bit, but at this point in the trial, again, it's not that the judge necessarily seems to be against Dick and Perry specifically, but he's not a very liberal judge who's willing to be like, yeah, let's do some tests. Let's check some things out. He's like, nope, nope, no. Nope. And he really doesn't give them many opportunities to go the extra mile to prove their innocence. 
I'm not sure that that's his job, but we can say for certain that he does not do that. Um, around the same time as the trial is uh, set to begin, the clutter's property is auctioned off. And 5,000 people come. It's the biggest auction that the town has ever seen. And I get a little choked up thinking about this because um, this is the last moment where we really see the clutters as people in the book. Um, I'm sorry, like it really, it's, it's very sad to me. They auction off all of their belongings, even the smallest things from their kitchen and from the barn. And at the end of the auction, they auction off Nancy's horse, Babe, which was, you know, her, just her best buddy horse that she, we hear a lot of stories of her and this horse. And her best friend Susan is there. And um, there's a scene where Susan wants to wave goodbye to Babe and then just ends up covering her mouth because she starts sobbing. And I think, you know, it's really symbolic. Again, this, this literary quality of the book, the auctioning of the property is really symbolic of the ending of that part of the book and the ending of the clutter's lives very officially because now their possessions are even gone. And so there's nothing still to kind of um, live on after their death. A symbol from Kenyon is that car that he has, um, the coyote chaser, the coyote harasser, or something like that. That gets auctioned off too. And so there are these symbols of the family that, that is now very firmly gone. Um, and it's, it's a very, it's a very sad ending to that set of their reading. And again, I think it's really evidence of Capote's value as a storyteller that he knows how to really pull on our heartstrings and make me cry on a video that I'm going to be posting for you guys. So thanks a lot, Capote.